Hello and welcome aboard the USS Ticonderoga for the next video in the Yankee Air Pirate training mission series. Today we'll be combining both missions 3 and 4 to cover approaches and landings on an aircraft carrier, beginning here with the Ticonderoga. She's an Essex-class carrier and saw extensive service in both World War II and Vietnam. In fact, it was aircraft from the Ticonderoga that were involved in the Gulf of Tonkin incident which is generally considered to be the start of the Vietnam War. This is hardly the first gaming tutorial on carrier landings, and it certainly won't be the most in-depth, but it will cover the main procedures of carrier recovery, as outlined by the briefing material for missions 3 and 4 in YAP, and it'll help you get down onto the deck successfully. Remember, a good Navy landing is one where most of the pieces stay on the runway, so that's what we're aiming for today. As always, if you're interested in further reading, look for links in the description below for my references, which come from both modern and Vietnam eras today. Depending on weather and time of day, carriers launch and recover aircraft under several sets of rules, Case 1 through Case 3. Because of limitations in Strike Fighter's weather model, we're really only going to be dealing with Case 1 and 3, essentially a VFR approach and an IFR approach. We're going to begin today with what is known as a Case 1 recovery. Case 1 is a visual, daytime approach with good visibility. We're over the boat here in an F-8 Crusader, a real hot rod. Its speed combined with the small deck of an Essex-class carrier makes for a good, challenging training mission to work up our skills. We're at 5,000 feet at 250 knots in an overhead marshalling stack over the Ticonderoga. The port holding stack is a left-hand pattern off the port side of the ship. This is normally only used in daytime good weather approaches. It's a five-mile circle, with the ship always located at the three o'clock position. Flights will circle at assigned altitudes stacked up at each thousand feet until they're directed to depart the circle at the nine o'clock position and head for an initial point three miles astern of the ship. To maintain spacing, aircraft climb when ahead of the ship and descend when astern, as denoted by this 3-9 line across the circle here. Marshalling probably isn't something you'd normally do in this particular game, as there's usually no reason to hold, unless maybe you needed to burn off fuel. Navy aircraft have a maximum carrier landing weight, and there's no fuel dump in this game, so maybe you would need to take a few orbits to lighten up. The F-8 has two fuel gauges. You can see that our transfer fuel system, the gauge on the right, is reading zero, and we've got about 3,900 pounds in the main fuel. Max landing weight is 24,000 for this aircraft, according to the manual, so based on the ordnance we're carrying, I know that we're now under that number and we can begin our approach. Don't be put off by all this talk of math and numbers, though. If you're flying more casually, just know that in this game, Pretty much any time you're returning from a mission with your ordnance expended and less than 50% fuel, you'll probably be fine for landing. But let's take a moment to get down in the weeds on this for those who are interested in adding a little realism. Many of the flight manuals for these Cold War jets can be found online for free. Here's the NATOPS manual for the Crusader, which is what tells us that the max authorized landing weight is 24,000 pounds. Prior to launching your missions in the game, take a look at your loadout screen, and you can see all the necessary information you'll need on weights. Our empty weight is 17,840 pounds, and you can see that at 50% fuel, with sidewinders and racks on board, we are just a little over that max weight. Do a little addition and subtraction, and we find out that with this setup, once our fuel gauges are under 4,250 pounds, we are safe for landing. These would be some numbers maybe we would jot down ahead of time, and then that would be our number that we'd be looking for coming in on the approach. Now that we know we are in our weight range, as we come back around towards the 9 o'clock position, we're going to leave the marshalling stack and start a descent. Right now, the waypoint is on the carrier itself, so on the horizontal situation indicator, the NAV-1 pointer is showing us the course of the landing area, and the NAV-2 pointer is showing us the course to the waypoint. The landing area course is only a few degrees off of the ship's heading, so it's essentially telling us the BRC, or base recovery course. 
The BRC is the magnetic course of the ship, and it's the heading that we need to parallel when we make our flyby, and also the reciprocal of which we'll use on our downwind. Carrier landing system needles are also active, as seen in the gauge to the right of the radar screen. This is the shipboard equivalent of your standard land-based instrument landing system. So you can always use those as a backup system to make sure that you're lined up on the glide slope and with the center line. The case one, or visual, approach to a carrier is very similar to the overhead brake that we talked about in mission one, and it's done for the same reasons. It's a fast, efficient way to get large numbers of aircraft spaced out for speedy recoveries. During flight ops, a carrier has large amounts of aircraft to launch and recover in limited windows, so time is of the essence when bringing planes back on board. A carrier on station sails in large race tracks within the box, a designated operation area. As it sails into the wind, it launches a wave of loaded aircraft, then swings around 180 degrees and steams at flank speed back to the other end of the box. There it swings back into the wind and slows to recover a wave of returning aircraft. Because of that limited time sailing into the wind, the landing process and deck handling on a carrier has to be a fast and well-oiled operation to get everybody aboard in a timely manner. Let's go back to the F-8 manual now to see what to expect next. We'll make our approach past the starboard or right side of the ship at 800 feet with the tail hook extended. The manual here specifies 300 knots, though I usually take it at 350. 300 knots is a pretty standard speed at the brake for most aircraft according to procedures, but lots of pilot recollections put the range anywhere from 300 to 350 in the real world. Sometimes veteran pilots would pull full afterburner shit-hot brakes at well above 500 knots. No need for that kind of showboating today though, so we'll just stick to a respectable 350. As we pass the carrier, we want to be far enough away that we can look down and check for a clear deck and spot any aircraft already in the pattern. Due to limitations in the cockpit views in this game, this may mean your plane needs to be a little further out to the right than the recommended 500 feet. The brake point will be just past the bow. Air brakes are optional, but the idea is to drop to 215 knots and extend gear and flaps by the time you roll out on downwind. It's tempting to yank back on the stick and put on a show for those down on the ship, but don't pull too tightly through this turn. Remember that you want to be at least 1.25 miles out from the ship on downwind. If your downwind is too close, you won't be able to wrestle these older jets through the turn to final and you'll find yourself wide. Watch your angle of attack indicator during the turn, and keep the units below 20. This should put you in the correct position as you roll out. Downwind leg altitude is 600 feet. When you're a beam of the fantail, that's your cue to turn to final. Remember, this pattern is a racetrack, not a square civilian pattern, so both turns should be continual 180s. If you've done everything right, you should roll out lined up on the center line on speed 30 seconds from touchdown. Navy aircraft don't flare on landing, so hold the on speed angle of attack all the way down to the deck. Pretty simple, right? Let's put this into practice now and see how it looks. Descending down to 800 feet, there's the ship just ahead of us, coming into visual range. Both the radar set and the DME telling us that we are six miles astern of the ship. A resting hook down and locked, we are ready for our flyby. Again, starboard side of the ship, 800 feet, between 300 and 350 knots. Looking down, checking for a clear deck, it looks good. We're just past the bow of the ship, so we're going to pop the brakes and go into our turn. Nice level turn. Speed's coming down, there's 300 knots. Remember, we're trying to keep the AOA not exceeding 20 units there on the gauge. That's gonna put us in a good position. There's 210 knots, so brakes back in. Drop the gear. And we're gonna drop the flaps, which on the Crusader also includes the wing lift mechanism. Something a little unique to this aircraft. A little bit of stall buffet, but we're down to 160 knots, which is what we want to be at for on speed in this airplane on the downwind. 
Looking over at the ship, looking for our visual cue, there's the end of the flight deck. We're a beam of that, so that is our cue to begin the turn in. Some sources specify that the LSO platform is your turn in point, but honestly, at these speeds that we're going, the two points are essentially the same. They're picking up the flight deck visually now, so we can begin maneuvering into position a little fast. And I tend to fly my approaches a little high, but we're still on speed. I just don't like to sink in these older, heavier aircraft. Coming around, holding that turn. Remember, it's a constant 180. And we're rolling out. The ship is moving, so we'll give it a few degrees to the right to hold our position with the moving landing area. So aiming right for the middle of the ship, I aim for between the landing area and the superstructure. AOA indexer is showing the amber light. We're getting a little slow actually, so add power, 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 and touch down. And the arresting wires bring us to a stop. Wheel brakes engaged, we'll secure the radar, bring the flaps and the hook in, and fold the tips, and let's clear the deck for the next aircraft. So that was a pretty busy operation. Lots going on there, and it went by way faster than the amount of time we took talking through it. So we're going to run through it again, and this time I'll highlight a couple of different points. First of all, for all the talk of numbers and procedure surrounding carrier landing discussions, remember that it's primarily a visual maneuver. Learn the visual cues, keep the ship in sight, get your head out of the cockpit, as my flight instructor used to say. Secondly, I tend to make my approaches a little high in this game. That's, again, because of camera limitations in strike fighters. Forward vision on approach can be very limited, especially in other aircraft like F-4 Phantoms. You'll be blind on approach if you're too low, so I keep it high through the final, so on descent, the nose can come down far enough to see the ship. You never want to dive at the deck. It's poor form and it's dangerous, but using the AOA indexer while keeping the deck in sight should help you keep the nose high. So that's something we're going to look at this time is that indexer on the way in. Because we can basically fly this approach visually just by looking at the ship and looking at the indexer. That'll keep us on speed and on the proper descent path. So here we go now, making our second approach. Hook is down and locked. We're just coming up on three miles astern of the ship, which is our initial point for the flyby, and we're descending down to 800 feet. We're just a touch above it, uh, just above nine at the moment. So we'll continue down. We're right at 350 knots, and there's the ship coming into view. We're a little bit further out to the right, then maybe I should be, but it's not the end of the world. We're still close enough to be able to check the deck for a fouled deck or a clear deck. And we'll just have to not turn as tightly through the first 180 to make sure that we get in position and not be too close to the ship on downwind. There we go, 800 feet, 350 knots, just as we're passing on the starboard side. Deck looks good. And there we're just past the bow, so we'll go ahead and begin our break. Throttle to idle breaks out, pulling a bit of G's through the first part of the turn. That'll bleed off as the speed comes down. And as we come down to 215, we'll drop the wheels and the flaps. Interesting feature on the Crusader, because of the low clearance between the belly of the plane and the ground, a safety interlock makes the speed brake automatically come in whenever the wing is raised for landing. So here we're on downwind 150 knots at 600 feet. The AOA indexer is telling us that we are on speed. And in fact, on the angle of attack gauge, you can see the open box range between uh, 12 and 14 units. That coincides with the amber circle on the indexer telling us that we are on speed. On speed isn't an actual airspeed. It's the optimum angle of attack for approach and landing. We adjust it with inputs of pitch or throttle. The green up arrow tells us that we are too slow or nose high. Amber circle is optimum, and the red down arrow means too fast or nose low. 
The Crusader, like other aircraft of the era, bleed speed very, very quickly, especially in low airspeed situations like this. So I keep the speed a little high coming through the turn. You'll see the indexer is red telling me that I am high. But as we roll out, I'm going to bring the power back and we'll get right into the groove and descend down to the ship. You can actually see the ball there just off to the left, though it is non-functioning. Call the ball at this point. We're going to stay zoomed in. I'm just going to make this approach completely visually, just looking at the ship. Slightly to the right, compensating for movement of the ship. We are right down the center line. I've got the power pulled back, but never cut the throttle, because then you'll sink too low. Just small inputs, let the speed come back down. We're looking good, right down over the fantail. And touchdown, full power as we come to afterburner, but it's a good trap, so back to idle. Secure the radar, hook, flaps, and wingtips, and then we're gonna taxi out of the landing area once again. So that concludes our review of the Case 1 visual landings, something that basically just requires practice over and over and over to get right. And like I said, if you're looking for a little more guidance or maybe some more in-depth explanations, look for those links to the references below. We move now from the smallest to the biggest, the world's first nuclear-powered carrier, USS Enterprise. Commissioned in 1961, she would have essentially still been brand new here in Vietnam. She was powered by eight nuclear reactors and was the fastest carrier in the fleet. It also just so happens that I was one of her crew members in another war in another part of the world 40 years later. But here in 1965, she's going to help us demonstrate a Case 3 approach in bad weather. Case 3 is used when visibility is bad and is essentially an IFR instrument approach. From a holding pattern at 20,000 feet, we'll drop down to the platform at 5,000 feet, where we limit our descent rate to 1,000 feet per minute. I have 16 miles at 200 knots marked here, but that's not any official distance that I've read. It's just based on the speed and distance needed to get down to 1,200 feet at 1,000 feet per minute. We continue that gentle descent until we hit the gate at 8 miles. The gate has a minimum altitude of 1,200 feet, and we dirty up the aircraft for landing at this point, gear, flaps, and hook. We hold 1,200 until 3 miles, which is about when we should capture the glide slope of the carrier landing system, CLS. We follow the needles in to 1 mile, which is when we finally poke our head out of the cockpit and pick up the approach visually down to the deck. This approach can be a little tricky when trying to apply it within the framework of Strike Fighters 2. When returning from a real mission, the game includes two landing waypoints that cannot be skipped, making it hard to calculate total distance from the carrier. We go now to our F-4 Phantom, returning from a mission and descending through the weather towards waypoint 8. Here's how the final two waypoints look when you're returning from a mission. The second to last leg is 10 miles long, and from the last waypoint to the ship will be somewhere around 5 to 7 miles, depending on how far the ship has traveled. This means that waypoint 8 is, more or less, 16 miles from the ship, so we can actually use the two waypoints as our platform and gate points. The gate doesn't line up exactly, but there's only a 2 mile difference, and it's just easier to simplify the numbers to match the existing waypoint. We're in a 4,000 foot per minute descent out of 10,000, 8 miles out from the platform. Speed is 425 knots, engines are back at idle. Unlike our last approach, we are glued to our instruments in the cockpit on this one. We're going to follow them all the way down until that one mile mark, and that's when we finally look out to take over visually. We're six miles out, maintaining that 4,000 foot per minute descent. We're just coming up on 8,000 feet now, 425 knots, so still a little fast. Pretty heavy weather out, low visibility, not completely terrible. We can see a little bit, but you'll want to practice this a few times during the day before you end up in a night mission with weather where you won't be able to see anything. No visual cues. You'll have uh, a little more confidence in your abilities after doing it during the daytime. So this is good practice doing daytime weather approaches. 
We're coming up on the waypoint here, which is going to be 16 miles out, which is our platform, so air brakes are out, letting this aircraft come down to 200 knots. We want to be at 5,000 feet just as we're crossing that waypoint. In fact, there's waypoint 8 now, and there's 5,000 feet, so we'll make the turn over. So that is the platform. So now we need to slow down our descent. We need to limit it to 1,000 feet per minute, so pitching up for 1,000 feet per minute and we're going to continue the descent down to 1,200 feet. Let the speed drop down to 200 knots. And we are nine miles out from the next waypoint, which is the gate. Descent is stabilized right there at 1,000. Just over 200 knots, 215-ish knots. Dropping through 4,000 feet, and we're just on our way down. Slight adjustments in the controls and the throttle will keep us on course and on the descent path. Now again, in this case, I'm going right down to the waypoint itself. If you want to use the real-life distances, you would actually... Uh, stop your descent at two miles. You would want to get down to 1,200 feet by two miles out, um, which would actually be eight miles from the ship. For simplicity's sake, we're just going to waypoint nine, which is more like six miles. There, we're down to 200 knots now nearly 3,000 feet, still at 1,000 feet per minute, four and a half miles out from the waypoint. Head still in the cockpit, our whole world is the instrument panel right now, just concentrating, doing our instrument scan patterns. Two and a half miles out now, with a thousand feet to go. Remember, this is the gate. Once we hit this waypoint, we're dirtying up the airplane and preparing for our final descent down to the deck. There's waypoint 9, so now we're turning in towards the ship. Hook is down and locked, gear is coming down, and we'll do one notch of flaps. As we come around on course, remember to give a couple degrees to the right to compensate for the movement of the ship. Again, we're dealing with the landing area actually moving to our right. There's full flaps and a bit of power to maintain us right here at 1,200 feet. And we'll let the speed come down to somewhere in the vicinity of 160, 150 knots. We'll keep an eye on those indexers to look for on speed as we're just holding here, waiting to intercept that glide slope. Three miles now, we should be intersecting the glide slope any moment, and there on the CLS uh, needles on our gyro, right in the middle of the instrument panel, we can see that it's coming down, almost going to be touching the, uh, the aircraft indicator there. We're at 150 knots. And there we go. There's the glide slope. Let the nose come down, and we're going to look for a 700 to 1,000 feet per minute drop to keep us on that slope. We do not want to go low. We want to stay at or above that glide slope to make sure that we don't hit the back of the ship and we can see the ship when we look out. Two miles to go now. Remember that we have limited visibility at the front of the Phantom here, so that's why we want to keep a little bit of nose low when we start looking for the ship at about a mile, which is coming up just a moment here. We're at 160 knots. 
Needles are centered. There's one mile. Let's look out, picking up the ship visually, and there she is, right ahead of us. We're perfectly lined up. AOA indexer is showing us fast. Once again, because of the visibility problems, I'm keeping the plane maybe a little bit faster than it needs to go, but we're looking good. I can see the wires. There's a landing area. Hold it steady. We're right on center line. Drop it down right into the basket. Full power as we touch down, catching a wire. Successful case three landing. As we roll to a stop, secure the radar. The lights hook up, flaps up, fold the wings, and taxi clear of the landing area. Now that we've seen an instrument approach during the day, our final demonstration will be a night landing, removing almost all visual cues. We'll be back aboard the Ticonderoga for this one, and we'll be flying an A4 Skyhawk. This is an interesting choice because we're given an early model Skyhawk that doesn't have CLS needles on the panel, so we'll be making essentially a night visual approach. This is a situation that you probably won't see in the real world, but this was the plane that the original Yankee Air Pirate team chose for training in Mission 4, so let's stick with it. It certainly does provide a challenge, because if you can visually land on a tiny Essex-class carrier at night, then you've got the skills to grease pretty much any other landing. For this one, I'm going to fly a third procedure. This is one that I often use myself, and is a bastardized version of both Case 1 and Case 3 approaches. So definitely not a real-world approach that you would see, but it makes some things easier within the confines of the game. As we saw in the last example, on approach to the carrier, your nav equipment shows distance to the last two unskippable waypoints. To get nav information on the carrier itself, we're going to fly through the waypoints at 5,000 feet and at cruise speed and go into the Case 1 marshalling stack. Remember, this is the large 5-mile radius uh, circular marshalling stack off the port side of the ship. This is a workaround that gets our nav system locked onto the ship itself, simulating tuning into the ship's TACAN. We'll overfly the ship at 5,000 feet, we'll fly the front half of the pattern, so only 180 degrees, and then we'll depart at the 9 o'clock position and begin our descent to the initial point at 1,200 feet, 10 miles astern of the ship. Okay, so here we go. We're coming up on the ship. We're at 300 knots, 5,000 feet. Fuel state looks good. DME is coming down to zero. We're going to watch uh, the nav two-pointer swing around as it does right there. Now pointing behind us, we have crossed over the top of the Ticonderoga. So we'll begin our level gentle bank to the left, holding 5,000 feet. Remember, we don't want to descend until we cross that 3-9 line in the circle. That's when we begin our descent, and also when we're going to level out and basically fly a wide downwind away from the ship, out to 10 miles. Here we're coming up on the halfway point through the first turn. Looking at the nav one pointer, which remember is showing the landing area and essentially the BRC, the base recovery course. There we're past halfway now. And the ship somewhere out there in the darkness actually can't see it. And the DME is rolling up to five miles, so we'll tighten up the turn just a little bit to make sure that we are in position. Still at 300 knots, by the way. Nothing crazy so far, just a nice gentle turn 
coming around to that nine o'clock position we're at five miles just a tad over and there's a course of 180 so now we are opposite of the ship's magnetic heading we're gonna roll out and the ship is out there to our left at 90 degrees at nine o'clock somewhere out in the darkness can't see it but nav 2 tells us that we are past the ship so back on the throttle we'll begin our descent now down to 1200 feet and we'll head out for a few more miles to come around for the uh, for the 10 mile mark astern of the ship No need to rush, no need to dive down at the water. I'm maintaining a thousand feet per minute descent. There's eight miles, so just before nine, I'm going to begin my left turn to final. Another easy, gentle 180, maintaining the descent. And we should just touch ten miles as we come around at the uh, halfway through the turn. Continuing around to get on course. Yep, and just kissing 10 miles as we're coming through halfway through the turn. So hook is down and locked. Holding 10 miles through the apex of the turn. We want the NAV 2 marker to line up with the NAV 1 marker. That will tell us that we are in line with the landing area and heading towards the ship. And again, giving it a few degrees to the right compensation to make up for the fact that the ship is moving. Shallowing out the turn, and I'm going to pitch the nose up slightly here to bleed the rest of the speed off. We're already at idle engines. We could pop the brakes or we'll just let the speed come down naturally as it crosses 200. We're safe for landing gear and flaps. There we go, and uh, flaps to just under 150 knots there. The two needles are lining up with themselves. So a bit of power just to hold us uh, right around here. We also don't have an AOA indexer, so we're really kind of flying blind. I think the later model panels in this game do have both of those, both the CLS, the needles, and the indexer, but... Uh, this earlier cockpit does not. But again, that's fine. It serves our training purposes very well because this is literally as hard as it could possibly be then without any of those visual references. So using power and pitch to hold us a little high. I guess I'm up at like 14, almost 1,500 feet. But we're six and a half miles out from the ship, so lots of time to go. With no needles, we're not going to intercept any glide slope. We just need to get close enough to try to see the ship to fly it down visually. Now, don't be confused. There is a set of needles to the right of the artificial horizon. However, they have nothing to do with instrument landing systems. That's a non-functional gauge here in the game, and it actually is tied into the toss bombing computing system used for lobbing nuclear and, in some cases, conventional bombs at a target from a distance away. So don't be looking to those for help here, because they will not help you. Nope, 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 not at all. Picking up my visual scanning and looking up slightly using the uh, the IR tracker, because if you look up, uh, you can see over the nose a little bit further. So, doing that to try to pick up the ship 
which is four miles away, still can't see it. But we're on course, we're at 1200 feet. Using the power to keep us there. Nose up slightly, there she is, I have visual on the ship. She's just there between the bottom frames of the combination glass below the gun sight. So she's just to the left of our nose. Now I'm going to make small corrections. It looks like we are lined up with the landing area. We're coming down onto the center line, so probably a slight left here in a moment, but this is all just visual now. We have no help from anything, but I have confidence. I think I can just barely see the meatball there, although that is non-operative as well. It's just decorative in this game, but I can see it. I would be calling the ball, I suppose, in real life. Can't get too shallow or too low. Good. Back on the power a little bit. Drop down towards the deck. We're nose high. And we catch the wires right in the middle. I don't know if it was three wire, but certainly good enough to bring us to a stop. And that concludes our landing demonstrations following missions three and four in the YAP training missions. We saw a walkthrough of the daytime good visibility visual landing, case one. We saw a daytime low visibility bad weather, case three landing. And now we've done a hybrid case one, case three, good weather, nighttime recovery. Once again, I hope you have found this video both entertaining and instructional. Carrier landings are difficult and require lots of practice with each individual kind of aircraft. But I hope that if you are having trouble, this has given you some pointers, and can maybe help you out. Good luck, happy landings, and I'll see you in the next mission.